Hi, and this is the Physics High Podcast. A quick quiz. Do you A, want to be inspired by science communicators? B, want to learn all about science education? C, want guidance on your scientific journey? Well, how about D, all the above? Now, when we look out into our universe, With the latest survey, we measure about 200 billion galaxies, now each containing anywhere from 100 million stars to up to a trillion stars. Now, if you include all the planets around those stars and the interstellar gas, that's a lot of matter. But did you know that only forms less than 5% of our universe? And none of 26% of it is dark matter. That leaves 68% of the universe filled with dark energy. Now today my guest is Professor Tamara Davis from the University of Queensland whose interest is dark energy and much more. Tamara is the leader of the dark theme with the ARC Centre of Excellence for the All Sky Astrophysics and helping manage the International Dark Energy Survey or DES for short. Now not only is she internationally renowned for her work, she's won numerous awards for her leadership in the science field and on top of this she's an international sports person but more of that later. Welcome Tamara. Hello, Paul. Now, it's safe to say you are interested in something that's made up of 68% of our universe, but we know so little about it, that is dark energy. So tell us a little bit about what dark energy is. How do we know uh, that it exists or possibly exists? And what's your work on it? So dark energy is really cool stuff. It was a bit of a surprise when it was discovered. It was really sort of firmly discovered in the 1990s. And it was the discovery that the expansion of the universe is speeding up. We had known since the 1920s that the universe was expanding, but we thought that that expansion should be slowing down because, you know, gravity pulls everything together. What goes up must come down. I throw something in the air, it comes back down. You throw the galaxies apart. They should be pulling each other together, trying to anyway. And the only real question was whether that expansion was going fast enough that the galaxies could escape each other's gravity and the expansion would go forever, or they would slow down enough that they would recollapse. So in both scenarios, they're slowing down as they go away from each other. But in some cases, they're, they're not slowing down enough to completely stop and fall back in. Um, and so that was the question. And some people went out in the 1990s to measure it by using exploding stars. And I can tell you more about that a bit later. But by using this technique, they man- managed to detect that this expansion is speeding up. And that's as weird as if I something and I threw it up in the air and it never comes back down. It accelerates off into space. Um, so something out there as some sort of anti-gravity or something's causing gravity to push instead of pull. And we don't know what that is, but we give it the name dark energy. So what's your work particularly on it? You've alluded to um, uh, massive exploding stars. You've done a fair bit of work with uh, supernova in that regard. Can you explain that? Yeah. So ever since the initial discovery, people have been trying to measure it more precisely and figure out what it is. And there's, there's two ways to attack this problem. One, you've got to attack it theoretically, like look at our fundamental theories of physics. What in that those theories could cause something to accelerate? And if those theories don't have anything in them that would cause the universe to accelerate, then we have to get better theories because we have to be able to explain what we see. So working on the theoretical uh, sort of is one direction to go and the other direction is to measure it more precisely and measure its properties is it the same everywhere in the universe does it change from place to place does it change over the course of history like over time and what i've been doing mostly is doing the measurements <clears throat> where you measure the this uh expansion and and detect it uh, more precisely so that you can see whether the the dark energy is changing with time or place or and that kind of thing uh, and my particular role is I then use those measurements and I take people's theories that they've come up with and say, hey, maybe dark energy is this. And I test those theories against what we see. And I go back to them and say, eh, probably not, doesn't quite work. Or, yeah, that, um, that, works, that works fine. Let's look into that further. Um, unfortunately, mostly it's, man, that doesn't really work so far. Or, uh, you know, it's not really, we haven't really got feeling theory yet. But the, the way that we measure this acceleration of the expansion of the universe is one of, well, there's many ways that it's done now. 
the in, initial way or one of the initial ways was using supernovae. So supernovae are exploding stars and there's this particular type that always explodes to about the same brightness. And that's super handy in astronomy because if you know how bright something is intrinsically, you can tell how far it is away. So when you look up at the stars in the sky, it's one of the major problems in astronomy forever has been how far away are they? We can see these pinpoints in the sky and it's hard to tell whether that's something really bright far away or something faint nearby. But if you know intrinsically that that thing is bright or faint, if you know exactly how bright it is intrinsically, you can say, oh, but I know that's bright and it looks faint. So that means it must be far away. Um, and you can measure exactly how far it is away kind of technique if you know precisely how bright it is. And so with supernovae, um, they were able to do this in the 1990s for the first time and measure the how far away the supernovae were and then measure how fast they're moving. So how fast they're moving thing is measured using the redshift of light. So the colors of the spectrum get shifted to the red if something's moving away from you. And so you look at the bright lines in the spectrum that are caused by certain elements that are common throughout the universe. And you look in distant galaxies, those spectral lines are all moved off to the red. And the ones that are moved to the red furthest are moving far fastest. And so you combine the measurement of the distance with the measurement of the speed, and you can measure how fast the universe is expanding at different distances. Now, the really cool thing is far away things, we're looking back in time because, you know, light takes some time to reach us. And the most distant of these super we were looking at billions of years ago. So we can measure how fast the universe was expanding billions of years ago and compare it to how fast it's expanding now. And that was how they discovered the acceleration of the expansion. And that's some of the work that I've continued. Now, not only that, your work is also involved in mapping galaxies as well. In fact, mm -hmm. one of the most comprehensive maps of galaxies uh, to date. How did you go about doing that? How does that work? When you look at the distribution of galaxies, one of the really cool things about that is that the distribution isn't actually random. And you can use the distribution as a yardstick, a ruler, um, to measure the expansion much the same way as we used supernovae, but supernovae were standard candles that the distribution of galaxies had patterns in it that are standard rulers. So the supernovae, we knew how bright they are. The pattern of galaxies, we know how big that pattern is. But to go out and measure it, it used to be that you would like point a telescope at a galaxy and you would get a spectrum of it and you use that spectrum of light, like I was talking about before, to figure out how fast it's moving away. And because in the universe, the things that are moving fastest are further away, you can give, use that as an approximate distance, even if you don't have uh, an exact distance. And so you can use, you can map the distribution of galaxies using those approximate distances, which are, which are actually pretty good. Um, and by getting a spectrum of each galaxy. That can take a really long time uh, because these things are so faint that typically we take an hour or two per, uh, per pointing to look at these distant things. We just point the telescope and we point at the same thing for an hour or two. We track it across the sky as it goes. And, um, and then the very faint galaxies will get enough light into the telescope to give us a spectrum we can use. Now, if we're spending an hour or two per galaxy and there are billions of galaxies out there, that's going to take a long time. <laughs> so I had to be smarter. And some very clever engineers, uh, again, in the 1990s, made an instrument that, that I use still to this day on the Anglo-Australian telescope, which has on it, it's like a, a plate with 400 optical fibres. And you can point these optical fibres at the mirror of the telescope so the light comes in from space bounces off the mirror and goes into the optical fibers. But you can position the optical fibers using a robot and make it such that the light from one galaxy goes into one optical fiber. Wow. Uh, it's super clever. And then these fibers go down underneath into the a spectrograph. You get um, 400 spectra at a time. So that instead of doing one at a time, you get that just enormously increased the, the speed with which we could map the galaxies. And a decade ago, we um, made a map of about 250,000 galaxies using this instrument, uh, which was at the time the, the biggest map of, of galaxies that had ever been made. Now, there's a couple of other instruments around the world that can do similar things. 
Um, the Slow Digital Sky Survey now has a few million galaxies and the DESI instrument, which I'm working on now, uh, has 5,000 optical fibres. So it's going to be absolutely ridiculous in the scope of the maps that it can make. So that's uh, really exciting. But even if you don't get the precise distances, there's another way that you can map the distribution of galaxies. And that's just by simply taking photos, but taking them in many different colored filters. So when you're looking at that spectrum of light, you're splitting the light from a galaxy up into its colors and looking at real detail where the spikes are. If you just take a photo through a sort of a wideband filter, you don't get much information about the spikes, but you do get information about the color. And so you can do a rough estimate of how far these galaxies of the red shifting of light just by their, their color if you have enough passbands enough different filters that you put on your camera. Um, and so I've been working for the last eight years with something called the Dark Energy Survey. And that's done a map of about an eighth of the entire sky. Uh, so if you look, hold your hands up like this um, at about 90 degrees and, and go around like that, that's, that's how much of the sky is in our map out to at least half the, the age of the universe ago. Um, so really deep uh, and in that we use this technique of just taking multiple colors and estimating um, the distance and just released a map of 590 million galaxies uh, in that. So over half a billion in that map of galaxies. And wow. we're using that to confirm the, the dark energy and dark matter um, proportions that uh, we we're talking about. So you mentioned 68%. We don't know exactly if that's the precise number. We're trying to measure that more precisely. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's 68, it still might be 70. It's around, around that, that value. Um, and we're trying to measure that more precisely as well as seeing if it changes with time. I love, I love the, the synergy of how astronomy moves forward as the technology improves. You know, we'll go way back with the telescope in the early 15th, 16th century uh, and photographic plates in the 19th century. And now what you're talking about, robotically mm -hmm. controlled, optical fibers, 5,000 in a bundle to optically to control, to map not just, oh, there's a star, there's a star, whole galaxies. That's absolutely fascinating. We're really in a golden age of astronomy at the moment with the technology that we have access to. It's phenomenal. With digital cameras on enormous telescopes, we can see so deep and so wide. So there's two revolutions, just how, how sensitive telescopes are, how in detail they can look and how far. And then a different type of telescope that doesn't try and look um, in as much detail, but tries to look over a really big wide field and get a, as much of the sky in one image at a time. Yeah. And the combination of those two means we're like these images that we're taking, the light that we're seeing has traveled si since before the earth formed. So we're looking at galaxies that it, it, and looking at them as they were before the sun even existed. Uh, and, we're able to look so far back in time that we're able to look back beyond the time when galaxies had first formed. So we're looking back into the dark ages of the universe when living galaxies yet. Uh, obviously, we don't see galaxies when we look there, but we, we can see the dearth of them as we go, go out. And so the scope of what we're able to see with modern telescopes is um, truly phenomenal. I was just sort of reminded very, very briefly, uh, there was an article that was released on April 1st um, that basically said, like, astronomers have put their books down, they've discovered everything that they need to know, but the sounds of it, you, you're familiar with it. I just laughed at that because what you're saying is, is like, we're only just scratching the surface. Yeah, I mean, I saw that article too. It was pretty funny. Uh, there's, there is a sense in which in the next few generations, um, sort of the next generation of astronomers, the next few generation of telescopes, we'll really have seen... We've done, well, we've done a really good census of most of the galaxies in the observable universe, though. It's because there is only a limit to how much we can see. The universe may be infinite, we don't know, but there is a patch of it that we can see, and that patch is determined by how far light can have travelled from the beginning of the universe until now. And we're looking deep enough that we, we really have a pretty good opportunity to see almost the entire observable universe. Now, we're a long way from understanding it all, and we're a long way from mapping it in the kind of detail that we would need to be able to put down our pencils, put down our computers and say we're done. 
Um, but we really are, we really have gone from um, when I started doing this 20 years ago, um, distant galaxies were, you know, considered a billion year, light years away would be a distant galaxy. Now um, <clears throat> we're talking consistently of just observing galaxies that are, have the light's been traveling for 10 billion years. Uh, it's just e expanded so much just in the last couple of decades that we're able to see so much of the universe now, which is why we're able to say with confidence that there's things out there like dark energy and dark matter. Just wouldn't have observed at all in any of our experiments here on Earth because we are so tiny compared to that vastness. It's only when you look at the big scale of things that these really big dominant spread out effects uh, come into the fore. One last question on your work. You're also interested in massive black holes. Is that related to your dark energy survey or is that another little interest you have? Yeah, well, black, black holes are really, really cool regardless. I did actually did some of my PhD on black holes. But the, um, the way I got on, into looking at supermassive black holes was because of the supernovae that I was looking for. So to discover supernovae, you have to look at the same patch of sky night after night and look for things that change. You can't look up and say, oh, in that galaxy, I predict that a supernova will go off, you know, tomorrow. But you can say that if I look at 400 galaxies, uh, on average, one of them will have a supernova go off every year. So you know, there's about one supernova per um, 400 years in a galaxy. So uh, what we do is we look at many, many more than 400 galaxies and try and find many supernovae per year. And... But we do that by just looking at the same patch of sky night after night and looking for the things that go flash. And we're getting this fantastic time-lapse image of this patch of the sky. And supernovae are not the only things that change. So I got into the supermassive black holes by there's this awesome technique called reverberation mapping, which you can do um, the black holes at the centers of some galaxies where there's a lot of gas in that galaxy that's falling in and like getting sucked into the center of the black hole. It sort of gets sucked in and, and forms a swirling pattern like the rings of Saturn or um, it's called an accretion disk. And that gas as it does that gets really, really hot. And so it glows really, really brightly. But it's not consistent because, you know, you might, you know, the black hole might swallow a star one day and then it might get more gas, a bunch more might fall. on. so it, so its brightness varies with time. So when you watch these galaxies, the centers of these active galaxies will vary in, in time. And we had, you take pictures of that and then you also take the spectra, the rainbow of colors, and the time delay between the variations in the pictures and the time delay in the spectra because the spectra are emitted from clouds a bit further out. And so by measuring that time delay, you can use the speed of light times time to measure the distance between those things and measure thus look and then look at how fast the clouds are orbiting and figure out, well, they were at this distance and they're orbiting this fast. That means the mass of the black hole must be blah. Right? So you know the mass. And so we've been monitoring um, almost 800 supermassive black holes in our supernova fields and trying to measure the mass of the supermassive black hole at the center. And these things are millions to billions of times the mass of our sun. So they're really big monsters. Um, but it's cool because I didn't even think, you know, when I was uh, at school or something that measuring black holes was something that I was going to be able to do or that, you know, seeing supermassive black holes was something that was possible. Black holes were invisible. But, yeah, you can't see the black holes, but you can see the stuff falling into them. And that gives you lots of cool information. So now a little bit about you. Um, can you tell us a little bit how you got into science in the first place? Was there a seminal moment in your life that sparked your interest or was it just a growing appreciation? I think I was, I was always fascinated by science. I didn't think of it as science as a kid. I just loved figuring out how things worked and, you know, making gadgets. And I, I do remember looking up and seeing Haley's concert was young and just being I was like whoa that's beautiful and but also how do people know that that's going to orbit and come back around in 76 years or something like that and just marveling at the, the fact that humans could understand that and predict that sort of thing um, so that was probably my first thing that I remember about um, you know thinking about science or astronomy but I didn't really have any ambition to be an astronomer I didn't have um, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. There was I had no sort of like 
big goal. I guess I did tell, if people asked, I said that I wanted to be an astronaut um, and I liked science fiction stories and fantasy stories and stuff. Yeah, but I didn't really know. And I went to, I did a science degree at uni. I actually did a science degree and an arts degree. You can do like a double degree. So I did both simultaneously. So I did, ended up with an arts degree in philosophy and a science degree in physics. And I sort of, when I went, I knew that I was pretty good at science and maths things I did well at at school and I enjoyed. And so I went to university and picked, picked science as the, the thing to do. Uh, and I chose physics because it had the most options. It was the most flexible. You could do lots of different fun stuff as well as physics subjects. Um, and uh, But I, I did bio, bio and chem as well and that kind of thing. And in my first year, there was a, a cool astronomy project that we got given um, where you could just, we could use some real old photographic plates and look for galaxies and stuff. And then moving on, as we went into upper years, there was other little things to do. And then in, I had a choice in my honours year, which is the fourth year of uni, where you do half the year as a research project. Um, I had a choice where I could either do a, a research project in cochlear implants. So, um, you know, doing the programming that for the cochlear implants, um, deaf people hear, um, or uh, I could do this other project on whether the expansion of the universe can be faster than the speed of light. And I was like, it was, I was tossing up. It could have gone either way. They both sounded really cool. Um, but I ended up doing the expansion of universe one and the rest is history. Went from there and did a PhD and then did some postdoctoral fellowships, which are sort of two or three year jobs that you do after your PhD. And I did one of them in Canberra and one of them um, at the Australian National Uni and one in Copenhagen at the Niels Bohr Institute at the University of Copenhagen before coming to University of Queensland and doing that um, there where I finally got a, a permanent job and sort of became a permanent astrophysicist. So you mentioned that you did science and philosophy. Have you found that been a, a, a useful thing or is it something that's just been a, a, a side interest? I'm, I'm curious to hear what your views are. Yeah, no, they've been very useful to do together. A lot of people are like, hold on, physics and philosophy, aren't they like complete opposites? And no, not really. There's a lot of philosophical questions that you ask when you're doing physics. Like, you know, we're asking about how did the universe begin and where is it going to end? There's some quite sort of existential questions here. Um, and the in physics, uh, well, in philosophy, you also do things like logic and you also do things like ethics, which are very important in uh, physics as well, really important. And so, but the things that you learned of how to create a good argument and, you know, we, there was a lot of writing in philosophy and like reading people's thing, um, works and interpreting and writing, you do all of that in physics. In fact, I didn't really realise how important communicating was until I got into like my honours and and my PhD, and I had to write papers about my work. And the philosophy training that I'd had helped in that sense as well. So I think the phil the phil I, one of the reasons I like doing cosmology is because it's a really philosophical question. You, they're philosophical questions that we can scientifically answer. And so I find that they work really well together, the two subjects. Uh, that's fascinating because, yeah, there's as you said, there's two sides to that coin. Um, the The whole nature of where we're coming from and where we're going. Um, Katie Mack's book, of course, uh, you know, about the end and so forth, uh, ties in with that. But the actual doing the philosophy has helped train you in in doing science better and communicating science better, mm -hmm. which is a really nice segue to my next question. You're well known as a science communicator. I mean, obviously, you've spoken to multiple places. You've been on TV, on ABC's Catalyst uh, numerous times, recently on whether there's life on Mars. Clearly, science communication is really important to you. What does science mm -hmm. communication mean to you? So when I was at school, I was a terrified public speaker, like just jaw shakingly, whole body sweats and shaking. Like I was just terrified of speaking in public. Uh, so it's hilarious. Like if my school teachers saw me now, that happened. Like how did she end up, you know, speaking on television and things like that? Uh, and it just happened gradually. So I wanted to reassure people that if you don't like speaking in public, it doesn't, it's, it's a skill that can be learned. So you it just do it gradually with little tiny steps along the way. 
Um, I started speaking at little amateur astronomy societies and talking to them about my work. And then I started doing a couple of radio interviews and things. I started teaching a little bit at uni and just gradually before I knew it, all of a sudden I was presenting shows on television. And so uh, it's probably the least natural thing that, that came to me, but if I can learn it, it means anyone can. Well, I think uh, compared to the discoveries that I make in my scientific career, that they are potentially important, but actually getting the community to understand and trust and enjoy science is possibly, the, in my opinion, one of the more important things that, that I can actually do because our whole society works by, um, you know, on a, in a democratic process where if most of the people who are doing that voting and, and um, talking to governments and stuff don't understand the science behind things like uh, climate change or vaccinations and that kind of thing, then we're all the worse for it. Uh, and there's a lot of, at the, especially at the moment, there's a lot of fear and mistrust and confusion and um, conspiracy theories going on. Communicating science is a way to counteract that. Um, not just communicating facts as saying this is how it is, but trying to explain people how you come to those conclusions and why we're so confident in the things that we're saying and where we're not confident, where there's still questions, because science is an inter eternal learning process. We're always trying to improve on the thing that came before. So I think communicating science is incredibly important. Clearly, you, you alluded to the fact that in the community at large, there's a lot of misinformation uh, to the point of conspiracy theorists. Um, so how do you engage with people who have a mistrust in science? What, what's the key? I think there's a many ways that you can go about this. First, just being a scientist who's a human being that they can communicate with is, um, is a simple step and saying, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not some evil overlord who's trying to trick you into doing something like no like I don't have any vested interests here I just want to you know make sure that the world is as good a place as possible um if someone is really way off the end into conspiracy theories it's really hard to change their mind what the my aim if I'm having a conversation like that becomes just to make them doubt the conspiracy theories a little bit get them like you know a small step towards trusting science not if you say if you come with an argument saying, no, you're not like, you know, that's all um, crap, then th that's nowhere near convincing them. But listening to them and, and uh, appreciating why their doubts um, and answering just a small bit and moving them slightly closer towards uh, understanding what science is all about is the way that I would go about it. You actually touch on something that I spoke to someone recently about uh, in one of my interviews, and it's really it's about relationship. It's about connecting with someone and getting to see them as a person that you're listening to them, and they are there, as a result will listen to you, and then you have an opportunity to um, to you know ask the questions and have them ask question their own point of view uh, without actually um, condemning them, so to speak. You're also very passionate about increasing um, the uptake of science uh, amongst uh, women. And clearly physics has, has had a, a really a very stereotypical history of being very male dominated. What advice would you give to um, uh, girls, women who are interested in, in science? Firstly, there has never been a better time to be a woman in science. It's uh, great. I've had a completely um, welcoming reception from all of my colleagues, male, female. Uh, and uh, I think it's, there's so much awareness. There are biases um, and it's clear there's been, there's stereotypes, there's, there's biases, there's hurdles that you have to um, overcome. But there's so much awareness of this at the moment that people are really trying to counteract those hurdles and give you every opportunity to um, take a career in science so it's a uh, yeah it's a great time I've had a wonderful time as a female in science it's a really um, you have a great chance to to make your mark and it's a really welcoming atmosphere or at least it has been for me I know that that's not universally the case some people have found like felt prejudice against them if they're 
not just a female, but there's also issues with people um, of color and different ethnicities and stuff. There's there's a lot of different inequities across society, and they bubble into the scientific realm as well. Mm. And so, but there is so much consciousness about this at the moment. Um, people are really making a really serious effort to fix these, and I, I'm very hopeful that that will see a lot of improvement over the next decades. That uh, leads us to a more broader, I guess, advice question. Um, let's say we have a high school student uh, watching or listening to this. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you, advice would you give them if they're thinking about a career in science? Go for it. It's super fun. <laughs> um, there's, uh, do, if, so first foundations and stuff. But if you're doing astrophysics in particular um, or just science, you know, having your strong foundations of, of maths and, and chemistry and um, biology perhaps are, um, are really key. I would also add to that computer coding. Um, just on like, you know, a basic level, if nothing else, if you're going into um, a physics field, then try and get as advanced as you can in something like Python, one of the computer programs. Those are really key. Um, but in general, uh, after you've sort of got that foundation and you're going into it, try and enjoy it. There's a lot of people get stressed as they're going through, fearing that, you know, if I don't end up getting a job in academia or like, you know, if I, I want to become a professor of physics and if I don't do that, then I've failed. That's a really, that's a lot of pressure to put on yourself. Um, and there are so many fun things to do out there in the world with a science degree that if, you know, if you're pretty much impossible to figure out what you're going to be doing and degree, something really cool is going to come up and take you in that direction. So don't stress that, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do in a year or two or what when this, this finishes and what my next step is. Make sure that you're, you're enjoying what you're doing and you're passionate about what you're doing because then you end up tr trained for something that you enjoy doing uh, and go and do that. I would add that uh, science, a science degree is really broadly useful. Like a lot of people will say, oh, if I do science, I'm not trained for something specific. Like, you know, I'll do engineering instead because then I'm trained to be an engineer and I can go and do engineering jobs. In, if you do science, you have a much broader scope of jobs to do after that because you're not just trained in that particular thing. You're trained to um, take real world problems, or in physics at least, to take real world problems, turn them into equations, find an optimal solution. And that's applicable all over the place. So in industry, um, in uh, in research, but not just research at universities. There's a lot of different ways um, to succeed uh, with a f physics science degree. Uh, it's actually really training them up in soft skills of critical thinking, isn't it? I mean, you'll have yeah. financial institutions looking for science graduates because they can look at a problem from a different perspective and, and solve that problem. Mm -hmm. They have the soft skills because they, they've trained themselves up yeah. into it. Yeah, consultancy firms will be coming to try and grab you at the end of your science degree to work, uh, you know, consulting and improving business models. Um, even if you don't have any business background at all, because you've got those uh, critical thinking skills. I would add also that the, the soft skills are not to be um, forgotten about. So the soft skills are things like being able to uh, write, explain your work, speak in public, manage people. And these are things that you typically don't learn that much in the classroom. Uh, it's more and more people are being asked to give presentations instead of written assessments and stuff. So you're getting a bit more training in that. But it's uh, they're as important as being good at the, the physics or the science itself. The, being excellent in your research, if you're a researcher, is critical, but it's not enough you also have to be able to present it and explain it to people. Because if no one understands what you're talking about, it doesn't help anybody. So that those are also important things. So join, join if you go to university, join clubs and societies, you know, run your, the go and run the physics society or join the, um, the, the musicians or um, do theater and art, like there's, or join sports clubs. There's so many different clubs and things that you can join. And there you'll learn stuff that you just don't learn in the classroom, which like managing skills and uh, speaking skills and things. So that's that's what I did. And it's not only good training, which I, I didn't 
the time how good the training was. It was just mostly heaps of fun. Again, that's a really nice segue. You talk about skilling up in so many different areas, you become a more rounded person, so to speak. So mm-hmm. we come to our last question, which is an opportunity for you to share a little bit about you, about you doing something different. Now, my understanding is you are an international athlete, international sports person. And um, I'm going to give the opportunity for you to share what you do and maybe teach us something about it. <laughs> Over to you, Tamara. Yes. Yeah. So I did lots of sport through childhood at, at school. I did um, surf lifesaving and um, gymnastics was my big one. I did netball and water polo and swimming and stuff like that, which I continued some of them into university. Um, but then in university, my big sport became ultimate frisbee. So a lot of people don't know what that is. Maybe you do. It's a team sport. You play with a frisbee on like a rugby field, but without the posts. So it's seven aside and it's maybe a cross between rugby, uh, gridiron, uh, like American football and netball, because you're not allowed to run with it, but you score the same way you would score like a touchdown in gridiron. You, you catch the frisbee in the end zone, which is where you would score a try in rugby. And that's a point. So it's a super fun game, um, really easy to play, and uh, it's all self-refereed as well. So even at World Championships, we don't have referees. So you that um, is a really good way to train up your negotiating skills because everybody on the field is a um, uh, is an umpire essentially, and so you're doing. Um, it makes it a super, super collegial sport because people who play it are the people who like that um, um, kind of thing. Uh, and it's just it's taken me all around the world. So I've uh, represented Australia for that uh, and captained Australia in various ways for, for that. Uh, and that's been super fun. And it definitely helped my science because in terms of managing teams, speaking in public uh, and the, kind, the kinds of things that you need to do managing a research group is very similar to the kinds of things you need to do managing a sports team. And you bet if the sports team, you get to practice it, you know, season after season during a year, whereas in it's much bigger stakes when you're doing it um, at uh, in your research group. So it's, it's um, great training in the fitness and keeps your mind alert, lets you sleep well at night. So doing sport has been super important to me. Um, for my research and my career, and as well as just my general well-being and life. Now, clearly, I'm speaking to an, a very successful frisbee thrower. I think many of us, including myself, can get maybe 10, 15 metres, others maybe shorter. Teach us a little bit about good frisbee throwing technique. Okay, so first things first, don't throw it like a ball. It doesn't, doesn't go up and down. It should fly sort of flat. Um, so here's one I prepared earlier but well, I can't see it because it's, a, it's not me. Um, but basically you grab the Frisbee like this. So in your, in your fist, um, you sh- turn your shoulder. So you're side on to where you want it to go. And then you pull it through horizontally flat, leading with your elbow and then release and point to where you want it to go. So come, come through flat and point to where you want it to go. And that's my, the, the main technique for throwing a backhand. But it's more than that, though. You've got to take an account of, let's say, any wind and air currents, because clearly that has a significant impact aerodynamically, throwing a physics term into place, yes. uh, on how it flies. So what, what do we need to keep an eye out for, particularly if we've got, let's say, crosswinds, headwinds, you know, backwinds? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So having the frisbee really flat is really important for if it's flying in, if you're flying in wind. Um, or you can use the wind to your advantage to make the frisbee go around corners and stuff. So if you tilt the frisbee this way uh, and the wind is coming this way, then it's going to get blown like a sail and move in that direction. So if you throw it and it has, I should turn my thing off. Uh, if you throw it and it has um, an angle like this on it, then it's coming this way. It's going to go like that. So it will naturally curve that way if you throw it like this, um, but it will also uh, fly with the wind. So you've got to do less of that or throw in a, a different direction, just taking into account the wind. And the more that the faster the wind is blowing, the more you have to put wrist flick on it. 
and make it spin really fast. That keeps it stable, which is very much a, a physics thing as well. If something's spinning, it has high angular momentum. It's hard to make it change angular momentum. So the more flick you put on it, the more you make it spin, the more stable it will be in the wind. So practice doing lots of wrist flick. Is there a good reason to have a, a forehand type of throw? I've seen some people do that sort of forehand throw. Is it something yeah. that you do as well, or is it uh, the backhand is your technique? No, you have to be able to do both if you're playing ultimate, um, if you're playing ultimate frisbee, because uh, usually it's a team sport, so you're going to not have the choice of where to throw it. You're going to have someone standing in front of you trying to stop you from throwing it. So if you can only throw backhands, there'll be someone standing permanently on this this side of you, preventing you from throwing that. So you want to be able to come out here and throw a forehand as well. So throw on the other side. Um, and so if you do that, I said the backhand grip was like this. For the forehand grip, you have to turn it all the way around and have your fingers on the inside of the rim. So you can do like that or like that. And then you, you flick it. So you bring it over to, to this side of you. You can't see in the, in the video. And, um, and flick it with your, your wrist like, like that. Uh, and that's that's the forehand. So if you have those two throws, then no one's going to be able to stop you throwing um, wherever you want. Now, I hope that everyone who watches this video goes out and practices that, that technique. They could become an international ultimate Frisbee uh, champion. Is there a competition happening this year? Uh, unfortunately, they've pretty much all been cancelled. So we were meant to host the World Championships for the Masters. So these days I work in, I play in the Masters division, which is for people over 30. Um, and uh, the, we were meant to host that at the Gold Coast in Australia. And we unfortunately, that got cancelled. So um, no world championships for us then or this year. So we'll have to be fingers crossed um, things will open and we'll be able to play internationally again soon. Because uh, as you do, as with um, science as well, you go to all these international conferences, you actually make a lot of friends around the world in all different countries. That's one of the great things that I love about science um, is the amazing people that you get to meet, people who are really interesting and inspired by what they read and passionate. And you get to meet those people all around the world and you make sort of an international network of friends. And that's true in uh, international sport as well. You get to meet lots of interesting people around the world. So fingers crossed we're able to do that soon. But for now, Zoom is the way to go. <laughs> well, Tam Tamara, thank you so much for your time. It's been a wonderful chat with you. And I do hope uh, all success in the future and maybe uh, a future chat on uh, more physics matters uh, is in, in the wind, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Take care and bye for now. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to get notifications of up and coming interviews as well as my other physics concepts. My name is Paul from Physics High. Till next time.